You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. And welcome to episode 43 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and for this episode, we have an interview that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. But before we get to the interview, I wanted to mention a couple things. First off, we've been getting a great response from all of you listeners concerning our latest discussion on Twitter. We've been hearing feedback from both artists that are new to Twitter and artists that have got the whole Twitter thing dialed in. So for our next roundtable episode, we're going to share a lot of this feedback. I know I've learned a lot from it myself. So there is still time to weigh in with your thoughts, comments, questions about Twitter, either through our listener line at 206-426-5683, our email info at cdbabypodcast.com, or by leaving a comment on the website under the show notes for this episode. And we'll try to share as many of those as we can. And the other thing I wanted to mention, speaking of the website, is that we've been trying to slowly but surely update the podcast website to make it more interactive. We're trying to do a better job of adding some more resources and such. So if you have any thoughts or ideas of what you'd like to see, please let us know. For instance, we've had a lot of people asking about our credentials and various experience in the music industry. So there is now an updated Who Are We page where you can learn a little bit more about Chris, Robert, and myself. But if there's anything else you'd like to see, just let us know and we'll try and do what we can to get items posted up there. Well, now that we have those housekeeping issues out of the way, on to our episode. Most people will agree that performing live is one of the best ways, if not the best way, to create fans and sell CDs. And over the years, I've seen quite a few shows by both indie artists and signed artists alike. And I have to admit that most of the recent shows I've been to, I left very disappointed and wondered why I spent all the money and effort to get out to the show in the first place when I could have just stayed home and and listened to the album. It's caused me to wonder if our ability to focus more on recording great albums at home and networking with fans through the internet has had the side effect of us losing touch with what makes a great live performance. Where in years past, artists spent most of their time and energy developing a show as that was their only means of attracting new fans. In this episode, you're going to hear from Tom Jackson, a live show producer. Basically, Tom comes in and helps the artist or band develop a show that will effectively communicate with the audience. I had the privilege of working with Tom years ago, and it made a huge difference in our nightly performance, which I'll talk more about with specific details in the upcoming roundtable edition of the podcast. I know you're going to enjoy hearing from Tom, so let's just get to that interview. All right, well, joining me on the phone is Tom Jackson from Tom Jackson Productions. Tom, how you doing? I'm great. Well, why don't we start off with you giving us a little bit of a background of what you do with artists and some, maybe some of the artists you've worked for. I am a live music producer, and um, what I do is take an artist who has recorded a record, or maybe not, but in most cases they've recorded a record, have produced it in the studio, and then we move that over to uh, the show part where they're going out on tour, going to do a showcase, uh, important gig, uh, award show, blah, 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 a presentation live. And um, I get them prepared for it. And just just same job in some ways as a music producer in the studio who's sitting there trying to think, okay, now how do we write this song? And they know that their their format is radio. Mm-hmm. I mean, in most cases, when you go in the studio, you're trying to, you're, I mean, if we're being honest, a lot of artists write with the thought of getting on radio. So they record with that, hoping they're going to get on radio for the exposure. And I'll go in there and, in a sense, mess that up. <laughs> 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 because uh, playing songs live and playing songs uh, for the radio are two different things. Yeah. Well, before we get into the details of all that, what are some of the artists that you've worked with? Because you've worked with indies and big-name label artists as well. 
I've done everything from – it's funny you say that because it's just such a weird, touchy subject with some artists who don't want – uh, people to know I've worked with them because they want to be considered the genius. <laughs> it's, see, it's funny. In fact, I had a manager just called me a couple months ago, and it's like, whoa, 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 you can't put that out. You know, you're going to make her look bad. Oh, man. And it's like, well, not bad, but she's not going to be the star. Authentic. Like, They're looking for authenticity. Yeah. So anyways, I've, but I've worked with artists from uh, people who are just starting out, young people trying to learn the deal. To um, like right now, I'm working with uh, Taylor Swift on her tour. Mm -hmm. So just fill in the blanks from beginning to the biggest selling artist last year in the world, mm -hmm. and that's kind of uh, <laughs> that crosses a lot of paths. Worked with a 14 year old kid whose parents came to me, and and I didn't want to do it. I passed it off to my assistant. Passed it off to my assistant. It was nothing personal. It's just like oh, it's a different animal. Yeah. But uh, they were persistent, and I was really impressed with them as people that they actually got the concepts. And so I, they slowly pulled me in, pulled me in, and I just helped them go out on tour uh, two, three months ago. And that's about two years later. And as I mentioned in the intro, we've worked together in the past when I was in Small Town Poets, and you were helping us prepare for uh, our little 25-minute opening opening slot on a, a pretty big national tour and I know a lot of artists are probably thinking what on earth do I need a performance coach or why do we even need to consider this stuff but it made a huge difference in just the impact that our little 25 minute set has or had so I think it's definitely something artists don't think enough about we always talk about how touring and playing live is the best way for artists to generate income and build a fan base and yet sometimes I think it's the last thing they look at these days. Well, I think it's actually becoming a little clearer to them now that the big brass ring is going away. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what I mean is, you know, the big record deal. Everyone, you know, it's almost like there was a spell cast over all artists. The the end result is a record deal. And and I think people are starting to think a little differently now. And I And honestly, I've never been busier in my life. I've got four assistants, just hired a new assistant. And uh, we're busy all the time because artists are realizing that their revenue, let's start there, comes from their live show. Mm -hmm. Probably an artist, 90% of an artist's revenue will come from their live show. And so, so how does that happen? Well, you know, different streams of revenue, but one of those streams is merch. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and in a nutshell... If you see people when they go to a show, don't buy CDs. They don't buy songs. They buy moments. And if artists can create moments on stage, people go back to the table and say, where's that song? That's what they're going to say. Where's that song? But really what they're saying is this. Where's that song that made me feel that way because I want to feel that way again? And if you don't create those moments, or they happen by accident, one night they happen, the next night they don't, you don't know why, then you're going to struggle uh, in your career forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you have the massive hit on radio, yeah, which is, you know, it's hard. But massive hit today is a little bit different. I mentioned earlier Taylor. Um, she's the biggest selling artist in the world last year. Sold 4 million copies. Well... Four million copies 10 years ago would have been the 15th largest mm -hmm. artist in the world. So uh, th it's changing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you mentioned moments, and uh, we'll probably talk in depth about that a little bit more because I think that's one of the things you really drew out of us when we worked with you. But I've just been to so many concerts lately, whether it be a local band to even some really big national touring acts, who their show just really had nothing. It felt like they didn't even want to be there, and they didn't do anything to try and create any sort of communication or connection with, with the audience. And I'm just curious what you think is one of the biggest mistakes artists are making when they approach putting together a live show. Um, I think, well, let's talk about a few things. first thing is the assumption that because I play music... I'm a good musician or a good band that we have a good show. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a big mistake um, because that doesn't mean because you're a great player doesn't mean you can write a great song either. Mm 
Because mm-hmm. um, you're a great player, you're a great band, doesn't mean you're going to make a great record. Uh, so the, the assumption that somehow, and this is the weirdest thing, in fact, we were talking about this just before we started this interview. Every Every vocalist in the world, I'm being a little facetious, but... Uh, has heard from day one if they're a vocalist, you know, you take voice lessons and you get vocal coaches and you, and you know that's part of the process. When you go into the studio, of course you get a producer. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just part of the process. We've been trained that way, but when it comes to the show, somehow magically you're supposed to know it, mm-hmm. and and the art and people don't. In fact, um, musicians are speaking a different language than what the audience relates to oftentimes and there's a disconnect emotionally and that's the problem because what we're talking about here is emotional connection with the audience Um, so that's a big mistake the assumption that because i'm a good band because i'm a good player because i'm a musician i know how to do a show Uh uh-huh how do you start to unpack that when you're working with somebody who's a new artist and maybe is a, a pretty prolific songwriter and has got people talking about him, some buzz, but yet they really haven't dealt with the live aspect. How do you start to unpack that with them and start them to see things differently? Well, the funny part is this. Um, I mean, f- not funny, ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> but is, uh, in, in the case of what I do as a live music producer, I can explain it, and this is the frustration of doing an interview even, I can explain it until I'm blue in the face. Until they see it, it's the, then there's the aha experience. So when I go work with an artist, the very first thing is I'm prepared when I walk in, usually. And uh, we'll go after a song that I know we can create a moment uh, with. And as we start developing that moment and the artist actually starts feeling a part of the process, they're realizing I'm not sticking them in a corner. I'm actually giving them more freedom. And this is more fun than the last time we played these songs. Mm-hmm. And then then I win them over, and then then rehearsal goes well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a simple thing. But if you're not willing to learn, I mean, that's where it starts. If you think you already know everything or you're in denial, don't want, really want to know, want to pretend, then we're not going to have a good rehearsal. Yeah. Well, you mentioned moments, and I think that's one of the biggest things you did for us with our with Small Town Poets in our 25-minute opening, opening slot. There's not a lot of time there to have a moment. And uh, I think what you helped us do is really achieve that with uh, one of the songs that I remember specifically. It was called I'll Give. It's not really a ballad, but it's really a mellow, kind of open-sounding song on the record. And we were just playing it like it was on the album, just assuming that that would translate the way we played it. But you kind of reworked the arrangement with us in order to really give more space in the live performance. Because in a live setting, you know, the, it, the, the, on the record it had a, a kick drum going like, uh, like a four on the floor beat. And it's real mellow, but live, you know, you got this giant sound system banging out a kick drum that just kind of destroyed the moment. And right. you really helped us kind of re-identify what the moment needed to be. And I think it really made that 25-minute set have some serious impact and as opposed to just being this kind of flat line, here we are, here we go, we're done. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, this is the crux in some ways. You asked me, just I'm going to try to tie these two together. You asked me earlier what, you know, what are, what are the biggest problems uh, or biggest mistakes artists make. Well, one is is that they go out and play the songs the way they are on the record. Mm-hmm. And and what happens is the song is in charge instead of the artist. Mm-hmm. So the so it's just this jukebox in some ways. And and it's a big big mistake. So the the truth is you want to rearrange the song. Uh let me give you an example. The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. Simpsons is a uh, 22 minute sitcom it's 30 minutes but it's 22 minutes and eight minutes of commercials so you know if you're a fan of the simpsons that's great you go and you expect your 22 minutes and we're going to equate the uh, tv to radio radio you need a three to three and a half minute to four and a half minute long song at the most uh you got to get into the intro there are rules for radio there are rules for tv it's 22 minutes da 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 well last summer the simpsons movie came out now if all the Simpsons fans 
and people who were just going in to see it for the first time and weren't big fans even, if they had gone in, sat down, and 30 minutes later or 22 minutes later, 30 minutes with commercials, it ended just like the sitcom, how would anyone feel? Mm -hmm. They'd feel ripped off. Well, the writers know that you've got to develop the characters, you've got to develop the storyline. There's more freedom to create a movie than there is uh, you know, a, a sitcom, because because what is the rule? How long should a movie be? Well, as long as it works. Mm -hmm. That's it. So you're no longer tied to the three and a half minute rule. And so inside the songs, and this is really the thing probably I do more than anything, inside every artist's songs, there are very cool things going on that the artist knows, but the audience doesn't. Because audiences are ignorant. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is they don't understand the musical things. They don't understand that somebody's doing a triple stroke roll here and, and a 5-4 time here and, and a mixolydian scale here and, oh, listen how I pull the Leslie into that and, or listen to none of that stuff. So what we've got to do is develop the theme so that we connect the audience to what, what is happening on stage. And this is really what artists want anyways. They want to have places in their show where they can be spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So we leave space in the, in the song where on a night when the audience is just in your hands, it's magical, we, ha we, we let this thing breathe. We listen to our audience. On nights when it's not quite going as well, well, we, we, still, we still do something very cool and we connect to the audience, but we just don't, we don't develop it as much. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea is to develop these moments that are inside the songs. And some of them can be musical moments, lyrical moments, visual moments, uh, rhythmic moments. I mean, on and on and on. Whatever is inside the song. The idea is not to change the artist. It's actually to develop the artist and the things that are inside the song. And that is a, that is a massive problem with artists. Because if I was going to ask you, let's say it was only 15 minutes that you were going to go out and do your show. The very first thing every artist thinks of is, how many songs can we cram into that? Big mistake. Mm -hmm. It's how many moments. What yeah. moments can we create in that 15 minutes? And that, and that means, I actually had one group, I don't know if you recall them, but uh, we... They did one song in, in a twelve. They had twelve minutes. It was an evening uh, at GMA that everyone was playing their twelve minutes. And every group tried to put three or four songs <laughs> in, and we went exact opposite and did this one song. What, what was, group was it? It was new songs, twelve oh. minute rhythm of the world, and we had bagpipes and sitar and, and African drums, and it, it wasn't cheesy. It was like. It was like the, those themes were inside the radio song, and the radio song actually went to number one. So, and it was like a four and a half minute song. But as we started exploring it, it was like, oh my gosh, listen to this tone. This would be cool. We put a bagpipe. Oh my gosh, look, there's cool rhythm going on back here, and so, and and we developed that thing into a twelve and a half minute show. Hmm. I mean, show is really what it was, <laughs> song. But here's the funny part about it, and this is where this is where artists need to understand. The next day. At this event, it's a bit, it was, for those of you who are listening, this is a big industry event that happens every year in, in, in the gospel music world. And there's probably, oh, three, 4,000 people that show up at this thing. And the next day, there was a newspaper that comes out every day telling what happened the day before. And the headlines that day was, New Song Takes Us Around the World. Hmm. And the entire article was all about them. Now, you've got to understand, there was a, probably 10 to 12 artists playing that night. And one of those artists had just sold two and a half million records on their first record, and this was their showcase for the release of their second record. And, and it was in the last paragraph, and you guys have all seen it, oh, by the way, they played, they played, they played, they played. Mm -hmm. and, and this group, New Song, is not, uh, in a sense, an A artist, but they stole the show because they created moments mm -hmm. instead of just sang songs so often especially now with the internet age and and people doing so much stuff online that they forget that those musical moments people experience music live actually move people and really cause a reaction 
I think that's partly what's been frustrating to me. Some of the concerts I've been to, especially artists on labels that, you know, you think they reach a certain level, they should know better. But a lot of them don't. And it's just like grabbing those moments. I mean, that'll that'll make someone a fan for life if you do something like that. Where the, and they'll remember it and uh, anticipate the next time you come to town. What what kind of moments do you think should be in a show? I know you you do your, your workshops and, and you have this whole kind of moments that should be included in a show. What, what are some of the moments? Yeah, I, have a gra- I teach a class on uh, creating moments. Um, and I have a little graph. And, and here's the deal. This is not a box. This is just ideas. There's a million graphs that could be written. But uh, some of those things are musical moments, fun moments, touching moments, Different moments, closing moments, intro, introduction moments, storytelling moments, depending on what kind of artist you are. But there's all kinds. The ideas are emotional connections with the audience. How I started doing this 20 years ago was I used to sit out and watch an artist. Now, first of all, I played before that. I used to sit out there and be like, okay, you got me, you got me. Oh, you lost me. And then I just started figuring out why you lost me. And it was emotional. It was not technical. It was not, uh, it was not, I mean, sometimes it was technical, but it wasn't always technical. Um, So the idea is, how do you stay emotionally connected to the audience and what emotions are inside that song? But some of the general ones are, you know, fun, music, different, um, touching, you know, the idea is stretching the moments that are inside those songs. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you have an interesting post on your blog where you had talked to the former guitar player for Prince. You asked him about one of those moments where it was kind of this big jam session. And uh, it's always surprising for a lot of people to find out that a lot of those elements, even though they come off as being spontaneous and and just in the moment, are actually rehearsed and practiced, and or at least elements of them are. No, and, they are. Yeah. <laughs> They are. And I know some artists would be, you know, probably going, oh, I can't believe you'd want to practice that. But it's really actually important to pull it off in a convincing manner. Can you just kind of talk about that a bit? Well, the the key here is that what you're talking about is Des Dickerson, who played with Prince for years. And I remember talking to Des, Des a good friend, and he said they would re- rehearse for a tour six days a week for six weeks. 12 hours a day. And, you know, for some people, that's beyond comprehension because, you know, the idea is, in fact, I had an assigned artist just the other day, their manager, this just shows you how ignorant some people can be. And this is a manager of an artist who's, who in her genre had number one song. And uh, the record company was going to hire me and the manager wasn't. So the record company calls and says, well, you know, we want Tom to work with her on the show because she was going out on this pretty big tour. And, and the manager's comment was, what for? The band knows the songs. And mm-hmm. it boggles my mind to think that this person is in charge of their career mm-hmm. because she's going to go out on this tour that's 350,000 people and sing songs yeah. and hope something happens. Uh, it's absurd. Instead of create moments. Thank God the record company guy actually used to be my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the A&R guy. So anyways, going back to your question, which <laughs> if I can remember what it was. About them actually rehearsing oh, yeah, a yeah. moment and how you approach rehearsing a moment. I mean, what did that even means, you know? So, well, here's the, here's the deal. Every artist, well, I don't know if every artist, but most artists run away from planned stuff. They want to be spontaneous on stage the irony is uh, um they're not Mm -hmm. or it's so rare it's ridiculous let me give you an example um let's say we're doing something on stage some night we're doing something verbal visual musical doesn't matter something that really gets a reaction from the audience and it was spontaneous something we did the next night we go out and do a show my question to that artist is are you going to do that again and the answer is of course. Mm-hmm. And I say to them then, so where'd the spontaneity go tonight? What they did was they learned. They learned something that worked, and it came from spontaneity, which is fine, because you're an artist, and the idea is to listen to that instinct. But the atmosphere you're in, which is a live atmosphere, and the arrangement of the songs generally does not allow an artist much freedom to be spontaneous. 
I, it, instead of being spontaneous, most artists really, if they're being honest, wing it. Yeah. Make it up as we go. So the key is always a balance of planning and leaving room for spontaneity. In fact, what I'll do with, with an artist is leave more room for the spontaneity. We know in this song, and, and almost every song actually, there's places to be spontaneous, both musical, verbal, visual, depending on the strengths of the artist or what's inside the song. And every night can be different. We can develop a solo. We can develop a story. We can develop uh, uh, something visual. Um, if, the, if the moment is there to be spontaneous. But we know at this place, we have options. Instead of the song being in charge, we are in charge. And if we can listen to our audience, understand the connection, and develop that, and know that we have the freedom to take those chances right there and have the courage to take those chances, we can develop more as an artist on stage than ever. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, artists just, they, they rehearse the songs, they stand on stage, and they wing it. Yeah. And, and every once in a while, some spontaneous thing comes along, and it, and it works. But as soon as that thing works, it's implemented into the show. Heck, that's what rehearsal's for. This is going back to the Prince story. Yeah. Everything everything they did was spontaneous. They're jamming. They're they're trying ideas. They're, but it's a safe atmosphere to try these ideas. Just like any jam session, there are times it's magical. <laughs> there are times it's like, whoa, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> like, yeah. Go get a cup of coffee. This ain't working. 